Hi everyone, it's Dr. Romani and welcome to this YouTube channel that's really meant to shed light and understanding on difficult, narcissistic, complex, toxic, frankly, relationships. Today's video is actually going to take on a little bit more of a, a, a severe, serious issue, which is the issue of how to cope and respond, or how does one cope and respond when the narcissist in your life dies. Since the beginning of all that's been happening in the world this year, there has you know been that question of like, listen, I'm thinking about mortality more, and what if this happens? I'm actually worried about how I'm going to respond, and that's a reasonable question. I'm hoping to unpack some of those dynamics today. So let's take this question on. What happens if the narcissist in your life dies? Now, again, we have many, many narcissistic relationships in our lives, right? Whether it's a partner, an ex-partner, a friend, and most likely it's going to be a parent or a grandparent. Yeah, sometimes a narcissist in your life does predecease you. It's, it's bound to happen. And perhaps, like I said, in light of all that's happening in the world at large these days, people are reflecting more on mortality and unexpected loss and wondering if the narcissistic person in my life passes, how will I grieve this? So let's start by talking about grief itself. Grief is a universal experience that coalesces around the experience of loss. We human beings go through a cascade of emotions that follow any kind of loss, especially a death. And while there are some common top notes to grief, not everyone experiences loss or grief the same way. Some people veer more into depression, others into anger, others into denial. There is no right way to grieve, and grief takes time. There is a reason that cultures around the world since time immemorial have developed all kinds of grieving rituals. It almost gives people time and always like a routine of something to do in that period of confusion and to adjust to a new normal and find their stride into a different future. Grief is a part of life and no one dodges it. Now sometimes people will ask mental health professionals, how long is grief supposed to take? And listen, there's no hard and fast answer. There's no number. We tend to look more at how long a person is impacted in terms of their normal functioning, their ability to care for themselves and get through life. And if they are pulled out of normal life for too, too long, that's when we get concerned about how long grief is lasting. Now, grief can also be classified as complicated. When those feelings of loss not only don't abate, but the person really struggles with significant negative emotions for several months or longer and experiences significant disruption in their life, they're not able to engage in their lives at all in the same way. Now, there are many reasons why grief can be a more or less complicated process. Existing mental health issues can play a role your own personal history, the nature of the loss, for example, the age of the person who passed away, the circumstances around their, their death, the suddenness of their, their death, and the preventability of their death. And then there's the actual nature of the relationship. You would actually think that happy, healthy relationships would be the hardest ones to grieve. And interestingly, not necessarily. There may actually be more of a sense of I don't know, resolve or resolution, a happiness that comes from being in a happy relationship. Even if it was snatched too quickly, there may not be maybe as much as much regret. You may feel you said enough I love yous, that you did share meaningful joy, that you both grew from the relationship, that there was consistent, unconditional love. But when a relationship is complicated and toxic and painful, that's when grief can get toxic and painful too. So that brings us to this point of what happens if you lose a narcissist, an important narcissist in your life. Now I've had the honor of doing grief work with many clients who have lost narcissistic relationships through death, whether this was a spouse, a parent, a friend, or a colleague. The prevailing issue is that in therapy, in therapy was the place they could say to me the one thing or the, the couple of things that they were not allowed to say to the world at large. They would say they're shocked, they're grieving, they're sad, they're confused. But the forbidden piece 
that's mixed into all of this would be another complicated set of emotions. Like I said, confusion, anger, resentment, but also, quite often, relief. The greatest challenge of the narcissistic relationship is the waiting, right? While a person's living, you're waiting. You're waiting for things to change. Your hope that there will be that moment of clarity, that they will get it. Maybe they'll even take responsibility for the things that they did and said, that they'll apologize for the things they didn't get right, that you might even get that proverbial deathbed confession. The fact is it's very rare that this would happen. One of the most challenging things about personality in any form is that it intensifies with age. It's almost like a sauce that gets boiled down and what's left, that thick, thick part is very, very strong. Agreeable people actually become really, really sweet in older age. Stubborn people become even more stubborn in older age. And guess what? Narcissistic people become even more difficult, more set in their ways, more invalidating. We veer into the direction that we always were. So the likelihood that the narcissist will soften in their final years is more of the stuff of Hallmark movies and not real life. If you got that experience at the end of a narcissist's life, that they turned around and finally said those things that you wanted to hear, I'm genuinely happy for you because it's very rare. Remember the mantra, these patterns are really not that amenable to change. Sometimes in the last week of someone's life, if they know they're dying, you'll get it, but not always. The grief following the death of a narcissist is very messy. Because of the hope that it would resolve, because you thought you would find peace, that you would finally feel enough in their presence, that some of the toxic patterns would end. And if it's apparent, there can be grief that all of this impacted you, that your parents' conduct Im impacted you in rather permanent ways. The penultimate stop on the grief process is acceptance. And acceptance is the highest order achievement for not just those grieving a narcissist, but also for those who are enduring narcissistic abuse. This is it. This is what it was. This relationship does not define you. It's not your fault. And above all, they won't change. And acceptance is an essential part, an essential step of all grief processes. It's just a lot harder with a narcissist, which is why the process of acceptance is so important to initiate while the narcissist is still living. So you can release them and take responsibility for your own growth. And whatever limited way you keep this relationship in your life, you recognize its limitations. If the narcissist has been out of your life for a long time, and perhaps it's an ex-partner with whom you shared children who are now adult, or of course a parent or a grandparent. Their loss can trigger a cascade of complicated emotions. You may not have thought about this relationship for a long time. It's out of your day-to-day -day life. And then you're hit with all of it over again. It's normal and these feelings will pass, but in the midst of those emotions, it's easy to feel that you're being sucked right back into all of it as though you're in these relationships again and that can result in a real sense of panic there may be passing moments of regret for what happened in the relationship you may start questioning yourself again because you're being pulled into the proximity of painful people again and having to almost revisit themes that you might have put out of your head a long time ago the loss of a narcissist in your life may also leave some pretty significant practical issues. For example, they may leave all kinds of logistical messes in their wake. Most commonly, this can be estate and probate issues. And honestly, they may literally be triangulating their family from the grave. Golden children still trying to take down scapegoats in the means of who gets this coffee pot or who gets this house. It's conceivable the will that your narcissistic parent ends up leaving behind is the last time for that narcissist to show everyone who's boss. 
have very realistic expectations about how these assets are going to get divided. And in addition, they may have gone the other way and just left everyone lots of debt. Be prepared for any and all kinds of messes upon their passing. And these will often be an echo of the very same messes they created when they were living. In some ways, people who have endured narcissistic abuse are actually built for grief. You are often grieving the living instead of the dead when you are when you've experienced and when you've lived in narcissistic relationships you grieve the missing pieces the fact that they're not fully there there's a chronic sense of loss in these relationships in fact you may find yourself regularly having to let go of relationships that you're actually in it prepares you at some level to let go upon death because you're so used to giving giving in to letting go because it's part of your regular life. The complex emotions that accompany the death of a narcissistic person in your life, especially if it's a significant person such as a parent or a spouse, can be absolutely overwhelming. It is absolutely essential that you be in therapy with someone who understands grief. Support groups may actually end up being a little bit of a mixed bag. While support groups and grief groups can actually be very helpful in processing grief and being in a room with other people going through grief, the loss of a narcissistic relationship is uniquely complicated. In mixed company, it can feel uncomfortable to speak ill of the dead or even reflect on your relief. And yet that may be part of your own personal process of letting go. In addition, it can also feel uncomfortable to feel emotions, like I said, that aren't typically associated with grief, such as relief, and others don't want to hear about it. So as such, a grief recovery plan will be very personal and may not follow the usual tried and true grief support group kinds of um, conversations. You may need something more and something different than that. I know that many people reached out to me wanting to hear content about how do you manage with the, the death of a narcissist because of the specter of the health crisis unfolding in our world right now. This means that a lot of people are taking a long look at mortality and risk within their own families. They're grappling with no contact. Do I break no contact? And how would they react upon the passing of a narcissist from their lives? especially when these relationships have been fraught for years. My advice, start the work now. Process the emotions of the relationship while both you and the narcissist are living. Maintain realistic expectations in life and in death. Recognize that indeed these patterns are lifelong and yet their passing will still raise all kinds of new emotions in you. None of this is simple. And you may control, I'm sorry, you may continue to struggle with the legacy of a narcissistic relationship long after a narcissist has passed from your life. All I can do, all anyone can do, is really send you strength on this journey. Although we talk about the universal sort of stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, and we also think of meaning and purpose as the last stage of narcissistic grief, or any form of grief, I should say, that it gets to be a lot more complicated. And I do want to say something about that last stage of grief. Finding meaning and purpose in grief is actually something that Dr. David Kessler has talked more about and he and actually uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote a book in 2015 about grief where Kessler's work on meaning and purpose got integrated into the traditional denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance model. I think that's very important to note because I think for people who are experiencing the grief after the loss of a narcissistic relationship, if you can get yourself almost to the, that top, to that place where you can find the meaning and purpose as we all need to find anytime we're going through loss. That's something to find even when the narcissist, like I said, is living. It's a universal process. Narcissistic grief is a unique variant on that universal process. But it's important that you find person or persons to talk with about this to process it. The discomfort of sadness against 
unfamiliar grief emotions like relief can feel very unsettling and feel like you can't take this conversation anywhere because the idea of talking about relief in the face of someone's passing is something that a lot of people out there are very, very uncomfortable with. You may be one of those people that feels uncomfortable with that. Find somebody who's trained in talking about grief to have these conversations with because we understand that the landscape of grief is complicated and it's individual. And the narcissistic relationship grief is sort of an experience unto itself. If you're going through this grief, have or going through it now, again, my condolences, because grief is never easy. But I hope this helps you understand some of the unique experience, the, the, the unique landscape of grief after the loss of a narcissistic relationship. Thank you.